Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on weird and true mysterious stories, from glitches to the paranormal. Would you like even more content? Here's my Patreon. Now onto the stories. Case file number 10,017, written by Kiss Me Goodbye. The light bulb exploded, and then it was brand new. This happened like an hour ago, and I'm still pretty shaken. I went to turn on the light in my bedroom so I could do some cleaning, and the light switch shocked me and made a crackling noise. The lights went on for a second, then there was a sound of glass breaking and the light was off, by itself. Obviously, my first instinct was to get all the glass shards off myself and get out of the room. I bandaged a few spots where the shards had cut me and went back to the room to inspect the damage. The light is working fine now, and I started to clean up, but when I checked the ceiling, every light bulb in the room was intact. I even felt for cracks and all of them are pristine. I know I didn't hallucinate it because I just spent 45 minutes cleaning glass shards off of everything, but I have no idea where they came from or what the hell happened. Case notes for file 10,017. A light bulb exploded, and then it was brand new. So this might be related to quantum immortality. If you touched uh, the circuitry of the light switch, and maybe there was some exposed wiring somehow, which does happen in older systems or circuitry, people don't quite install them right. So there is some issues like that. There's some people that have uh, no paneling on the switch. There's just like the box sticking from the wall and there's a hole in the wall. So if that's the case in your situation, where there was some kind of exposure, maybe to uh, the actual circuitry of the light switch, then maybe, especially if your hand was wet, you touched it, and because your hand was wet, the resistance, the ohms, would be much lower, and then even the smaller amount of amps in that uh, light switch circuit, you know, just 110 volts, because of the lowered resistance from your wet hand, that could result in death. Now, if that's not the case, if it was just a normal wall switch with nothing exposed and your hand wasn't wet, then I'm not sure. I wonder why it was tripped at all? Why did the light bulb explode to such a great degree? And if it's the case where it wasn't quantum immortality, it seems like a natural local reset of the light bulb. But why would the universe do that? Why would anyone care? Is it a developer in the simulation You're just looking over the parameters and saying, oh yeah, this light bulb exploded when it wasn't supposed to, so let's reset it. Why would that matter? It's just a light bulb. Wonder if the cuts that you had, maybe the cuts would have killed you. Maybe you would have gotten an infection. Did the cuts disappear? If you were still cut, hmm, I'm not sure. This is a strange one for sure. It's like a localized time reset, but not time exactly. It's just the physical object repaired itself. Like the universe casted Reparo on it. How peculiar. But it's even beyond that because the glass shards still were there. So it's not just Reparo where they came back into themselves, reformed like Humpty Dumpty, put back together. No, they were duplicated. The mass was recreated from somewhere. That's not normal, because that should require an enormous amount of energy, even just for glass. Any physical matter has so much energy bound in a strong nuclear force, it's almost incomprehensible. A single feather could blow up an entire city if all the mass of it was converted instantly into energy at 100% efficiency. Even atomic bombs don't even come close to 100% efficiency. Creepy file number 83, written by Far Cry Fan 15, Secrets of the Deep Appalachian Mountains. Okay, so first off, these stories are 100% true. Most were told by family and friends through the years, along with some of my own encounters in the rural mountains and ridgelines of my county. Of course, as with all creepy stories, to give you a good scare, take them with a grain of salt. However, I must still say that these stories are as real as me sitting here writing this up. I hope you all find these as interesting as I do. Background I have grown up in eastern Kentucky for several years since the age of one. My family, both sides, have grown up in the rural Appalachian their whole lives as well. But as with modern times, moved to this small town nestled here in a valley situated in between rolling hills and deep ridgelines. Where the following stories take place is a rural area nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. It's got a name and it's considered a county. However, the area where my dad's family grew up in within this area, and where these stories come from, is more like a collection of deep ridges and mountain folks than anything else, just to clear up any confusion that this is an actual town. During the early days of the settlers, these mountains were home to the Cherokee Indians. Many cemeteries in this area actually have around 30 to 40 graves of Native Americans buried there, 
marked with stones and rocks rather than a more traditional Indian burial routine. In the 1800s, George Washington's aide-de-camp, Colonel Grayson, was bestowed upon him a 70,000-acre piece of land, which is now where my town is located today. Story number one. In the 1970s or 80s, my mom and her aunt along with her small cousins were driving on an empty road just outside of town when they crested the top of a hill where an abandoned farmhouse stood. They stopped the car in its tracks when they saw a massive hovering saucer-shaped craft hovering over the house. Frightened, my mother and her aunt booked it out of there at a high rate of speed. Scared, they continued down the mountain back to town quickly. However, when they looked in the rearview mirror, they saw the craft coming after them fast, tailing the car and keeping up with them. They attempted multiple times to evade the craft, but to no avail. It chased them for over a mile back to town until finally, just at the edge of the county road that leads back into town, it finally disappeared. My mother has told the story at least a hundred times to family and friends, most of whom believe her, as they too have seen strange lights in the sky in and around the various areas of the community though some don't. She drew me a picture of the spacecraft a few years ago, which I still have. It's grey and almost metallic looking. By the way, she drew it as having red lights on all edges of the bottom of the craft along with a few green lights on the sides of it. Story number two. When my mother was a child, old enough to know when something was going on, she was at home with her parents and siblings one night and a man whom her mother and family already knew and were acquainted with barged into the house terrified out of his wits. He lived in a cabin deep within the woods some miles away. During his stay there, he reported poltergeist activity, orbs, and other bizarre activity within the property and the house itself. He would go on to tell my grandmother that reportedly he was tormented all night by a demon who threw pots and pans, glasses, and even furniture at him. This went on for almost the entire night. It would throw them completely out of the cabinets, almost hitting him with it. It also reportedly started knocking and tapping on the sides of the house and thumping the walls and ceiling. Finally, he mustered up the nerves to utter the Lord's Prayer and attempt to rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. This seemed to piss him off even more and cause it to become even more aggressive and now would try to kill him with heavier objects. He ran from the house and spent around seven to eight hours walking through the woods and rural county roads back to my grandmother's house. While on his way to the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps trailing him in the woods and next to the road, but he couldn't see anything. He continued this for several hours until he finally reached their house. Story number three. In the 90s in town sat a white brick house at the top of a small hill where a man and his wife lived for several years. The man was in his 40s or 50s and the woman somewhere around the same age, I believe. Anyways, one day, while my mother was working at a local gas station where the woman also coincidentally worked at, the man had called her saying that something was wrong with the gas in the house and he was going to look at it to see if he could fix it. The gas was located in the basement. He went downstairs and laid on his back and crawled up under the thing to see what happened. He lit a match and immediately the house exploded, sending rubble everywhere and a massive fireball and smoke that could be seen throughout town. The man's wife, who saw the explosion from the gas station, ran home to discover the house gone and nothing left but its foundations. The man's body, as one might expect in a situation like this, was blown into pieces with body parts even littering some neighboring houses. Since then, it has become a local legend that the man's spirit haunts the house that was built on the land where the original one stood. The show Ghost Hunters, or maybe another ghost hunting TV series, actually filmed an episode here because of the experiences by the home's inhabitants. Everything from pots and pans rattling and stuff being thrown around to actual manifestations inside the residence. Case Notes for the Creepy File Number 83 Secrets of the Deep Appalachian Mountains yeah, so obviously for me, UFOs, yay, <laughs> they always catch my eye. Stories revolving around UFOs, unidentified objects. Now, is it an alien? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sure the military is testing all kinds of weird experimental aircraft. The fact that it pursued you, but didn't seem to be able to catch up, kind of leads me more towards it not being alien. They would have caught up before you could even start the car or turn it around or whatever. 
alien technology would be so far beyond us, it would be indistinguishable from magic. There's an extra quote of the day from Arthur C. Clarke. Sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, think about going back to the days of a caveman and bringing them a cell phone or tra talking about a computer or the internet or electricity or any of that. It would be like magic to them. They wouldn't even be able to comprehend it. We might be able to recognize that it's a ship, but how it functions, its propulsion systems, it, its ability to resist gravity, nullify it, invert it, to not account for g-forces, for any inhabitants of the ship, and so on. It's a different realm entirely. But yeah, just the idea of uh, the Appalachians is fascinating to me. Exposed wilderness that's almost untouched, and just tens of thousands of square miles of majestic, pristine wilderness is so cool. And what's out there? Mystery. Unexplored. You know, I would love to walk the entire trail that there is on the Appalachian mountain range. I think it's 2,100 miles from West Virginia all the way to Maine. And apparently it takes people like half a year to walk it. <laughs> Obviously with a lot of camping and there's small towns nestled between the trails where you can walk off and just go stay in a hotel, take a shower and so on. If I did that, I wouldn't do it alone. I would definitely have someone else come with me. Doing it alone would be quite a undertaking. It would remove some of the magic. I mean, part of the magic of it and the thrill is taking on the world, traveling it with a companion. A lot of things coming in my life. A lot of adventures I've yet to embark on. And now time for the quote of the day. Sometimes, you never appreciate the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Dr. Seuss. I mean, it's so important to appreciate the moment, isn't it? The present is called the present for a reason. It's literally a gift every single minute we're alive. You want that gift to endure, but the best you can do is just play the hand you're dealt and enjoy where you're at. Now obviously, if you're being tortured in some prison camp as a prisoner of war, it'd be difficult, but assuming your life is basic level decent, you know, appreciate that. I think uh, probably a good idea and appreciate the moments you have with the people you love because that's what really matters. Friends, family, acquaintances, even work colleagues, they all matter. They should, anyways. If you value them, and your actions show that, usually, it'll be reciprocated. And then, who knows what kind of adventures you'll get off to with them. Exciting times. Like the video, subscribe. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.